Uh, morning, everyone. Morning. We have been doing a series on the creed, and as Claire says, the, the core of our faith, the core of our trust is Jesus. So if you're here and you don't know Jesus, or you're estranged from Jesus, or you're not sure about faith, or you've been in church before and you're kind of finding your way back in gradually, you just need to know above anything else, it's all about Jesus. He is our living hope. And what the creed does, it's a, it's a set of... Um, core beliefs that Christians have proclaimed down the centuries to remind ourselves what is really key, what is really important, what really matters. Plenty of times we get caught up in secondary issues, things that are, yes, they do have their place, they do have their importance, but they're not the prime thing that we're supposed to focus on. And subsequently, we don't give enough uh, time and energy and effort to thinking about those things that are key. And so when we go through a series like Creed, it reminds us that Jesus is our living hope, that he, that he, born of a virgin, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified dead, rose again on the third day. But the culmination of the Creed says, I believe in the life everlasting. Everyone say life everlasting. I believe in life everlasting. It's important that we have people in this day and age who believe in life everlasting. Because if we only believe for this life, then we are missing so much. And we are shortchanging ourselves and shortchanging our faith. The Bible says that life everlasting, life of the age, it is an incredible thing. And it is, it's a culmination of what we believe, what Jesus offers us, a living hope, life without end, world without end end. So it's important for us to think about that and to grasp and grapple with the issue. What does it mean? What does it look like? What are the implications? What difference does it make? Now before we get into the scripture, I just want to ask you a simple question. Put your hand up here if you have a bucket list. Hands up. Okay, put your hand up if you know what a bucket list is. Okay, fantastic. Brilliant. Uh, if you have a bucket list, Shout out for me some of the things that you've got on your bucket list. Let me hear them. Wing, Wing walk and a pilot, was that? Yeah. That's like two, you two need to talk to each other. <laughs> One's going to fly the plane, the other is going to jump on the wing. What else? Dance with Beyonce. Dance with Beyonce. <laughs> you want to dance with Beyonce, not dolphins. <laughs> dance with Beyonce, nice. It's a bucket list, yeah. What other ones? Go to Israel, very good, yeah, it's not for points, you know. <laughs> we get it, you're holy, okay. Uh, other things. Build my own house. Build my own, now that is a bucket list that I can identify with. I'll build my own house and then I'll dance with Beyonce in it, maybe. But really, I, would, I, I identify with that. I would love to build my own house. It would be chic. It would be sleek. It would be cream. It would be chrome. It would be marble. It would be wood. It would be cantilevered. It would be expressionist. It would be minimalist. It would be in sympathy with its surroundings. It would be a thing of sublime and transcendent beauty. Yes. I sometimes get carried away when I think about that house. <laughs> we have this concept in our culture of a bucket list. It's popular, popularized by the film that came out, I think it was in 2006, starring Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson as, well, Morgan Freeman and Jack Nicholson. <laughs> and these two men find themselves from the different sides of the tracks, but united together in uh, impending death, they're looking at the mortality and they say, before we kick the bucket, here's a list of things that we want to do. And so bucket list enters the popular cultural understanding, this idea, and it, it perfectly fits with our culture. Because the bucket list today, as we kind of interpret it, it's a list of Instagrammable moments that we want. We want to have photogenic times that we can put on our social media feed. We want to do things that are interesting and exciting and maybe glamorous and maybe they include celebrity maybe they include great experiences you've got places that you want to go you've got dishes that you want to eat you've got experiences you want to be you want to be on the edge you want to walk the wing you want to pilot the plane you want to build the house 
And bucket list is a kind of aspirational list of people saying, in this life, in this world, with this time that we've got, we want to experience great things. We want to do great things. But there's a sadness about the bucket list. Because the bucket list ultimately, as well as saying all the things we aspire to achieve, it reminds us that the clock is ticking. It reminds us that the time is limited. It reminds us that the more we go across in life, the more our options close in on us. And you better try and get as much as you can. You better try and pilot that plane while you still have your eyesight. You better try and build that house while you've still got the energy. You better try and dance while you can still dance. You need to do these things because one day you're not going to be, do, be able to do the things that you aspire to do. And then finally, you do kick the bucket. And so the bucket list it's kind of almost like a shout against the void that faces us. And it's this whole thing where we say we want to do things, but we've only got one life to live. And one of the trumpet cries of millennials today is YOLO, which means... Brilliant. All the millennials say you only live once. You only live once, so let's do as much as we can. You only live once, so let's... Uh, just to have as much as we can out of life. Let's enjoy every stimulus. Let's fill ourselves with everything that we can. You only live once. Let's make the most of it. And when we talk about the creed, life everlasting, actually the Bible, it gives us a different perspective on this. It says if you live your life for a bucket list, if you have a YOLO mentality, while it sounds like a good thing, it's actually something to be pitied. And so when Paul wrote his longest chapter in all of his letters to um, a church in Corinth in Greece, around about 20 years after Jesus was crucified, he said this to them. He said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people to be pitied. If the dead are not raised, if this life is all you have, if YOLO is true, well then let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. In other words, if this life is all there is, and if our faith is just about this life, that's a pitiful thing. And you might as well just go for the bucket list. You might as well just get as much as you can, while you can, where you can. Eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow death closes off every option. Tomorrow death brings everything to a screeching halt. Tomorrow, death puts a full stop on every sentence in your heart and in your life. That there is nothing beyond that. But the Bible says there is. But this idea of you only live once, bucket list, eat, drink and be merry, it's basically materialism. And materialism says this. It says all that matters is matter. Materialism says that the material world is all that we experience, it's all that exists, and it's the only thing that matters. We, there is no spiritual, there is no transcendent, there is no uh, ethereal. And so eat and drink, experience and dance and build and earn and go and travel and do, because tomorrow we die. Now, as people that follow Jesus, we believe Everyone say amen. amen. We believe that Jesus offers us life everlasting. I believe in life everlasting. I believe that it's not the end. Amen. Death isn't the end. Death isn't the final say in my life. That God gives us a life which is a life of the ages, a life everlasting. But if we're honest with ourselves... Many of us look at the life everlasting and we think it sounds great in theory, but I'm not so sure that it's that wonderful or that amazing to look forward to. You see, the problem with materialism is that it's, it's nice. Put your hand up if you enjoy being material. And then when we have the images that we get about the life to come, the life everlasting, they're immaterial, they're insubstantial, they are ethereal, ephemeral, that they are, they're kind of, you know, spacey and gooey and ghosty. And we look at these things and we think, oh, I'm not so sure that's wonderful to look forward to. Of course, in theory, 
I, uh, I want to go to Israel and I want to live forever. In theory, these things are all good, but I'm not so sure that it's that compelling a picture to look forward to. And so we don't think about it, we don't concentrate on it, we don't grapple with what it looks like. Because we have a kind of image of an immaterial, insubstantial life where we're there on a cotton wool, fluffy white cloud with a white nighty from Marks and Spencer strumming a harp that looks more like an egg slicer and uh, it's eternal choir practice. Uh, the best film that I saw this year, Claire, you would like this, is a small art house film called The Ghost Story starring Casey Affleck. Put your hand up if you've seen this film. Yeah, Kate, okay, we watched it together. I, I know you. <laughs> yeah, you've seen it as well. Um, it is an amazing film. Casey Affleck lives a good life with a beautiful wife, and then he has a tragic death, and everything comes to a screeching halt. He's on the slab in the mortuary, covered with his sheet. And then the movie goes into surrealism. He gets up off the slab, but the sheet walks with him. And he spends the rest of the film as a ghost with this white sheet over him and two holes for eyes. And uh, it is the most incredible thing as he becomes unmoored from time and space. And he sees his life and his former world just carry on without him. And he sees the grieving of his wife and he sees the passing of time. And all he does is he stands in the corner of rooms and impassively watches. He he doesn't say, he doesn't speak, he doesn't talk, he doesn't interact, he's not active, he's just there. And it is, it's a beautiful film, it's a profound film. But for many of us, our idea of the afterlife, the age to come, what is it like? We know it can't be that bad like Casey Affleck underneath a white sheet, but somehow we think that it, maybe it's like Patrick Swayze in Ghost. For those of you old enough to remember Patrick Swayze or Ghost where it's beautiful Molly, and then he goes into the kind of, he's just beamed up, and he's like this kind of, you, you can't grasp him because he's gone into this bright white light. What does it look like? That's exactly the question that Paul asks. He says this, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? It's a really good question. Because we tend to think about our lives now. We've got fun, we've got Kit Kats and football, we've got iPhones and Ikea. We've got all these things, we've got nectar points. We can go places, we can hike, we can swim, we can dive, we can explore, we can create, we can mold clay, we can do all these things. We have this incredible life. But when we think about the life to come, what kind of body do we have? Are we just a kind of transcendent being on a cloud? Do we float through the air? Do we waft for billions of years? What is it? And Paul gives us this insight. He says, think about it like this. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be. So if you sow an oak tree, you don't take an oak tree and put it under the ground and then an oak tree comes up. No, no, you, you start with something that looks radically different. You plant with just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else, but God gives it a body as he has determined. And to each kind of seed, he gives its own body. This is really, really interesting because Paul says there is a life to come. There is life everlasting. And it is, in some profound, yet very, very definite way, connected. Connected. Everyone say connected. It's connected to the life and the experience that I have today, here and now. Just as an oak tree is connected to a walnut, is it a walnut? What is it? A acorn. Acorn. I was never very good at, at biology. What's a walnut become then? All right, all right. I am doing my best, okay. point is it's connected and this tiny seed you would look at it and if you'd never seen an oak tree you'd never believe what it could produce something which is so magnificent so awesome so incredible that it fills the sky the birds nest in its branches it produces blossom and beauty it comes out of this small unprepossessing thing it's connected and yet it's far more glorious, vastly superior. And the Bible says, the life that we have, the age to come, it's not some kind of black and white version, a poor copy 
of what we have now? Something flimsy, insubstantial, compared with the great things that we can do now? No, he says, what we have now is just a seed. The body that God gives out of that seed, buried in the ground, is un it's, it's beyond anything that we can comprehend. So when we see Jesus, we see Jesus living the life everlasting, coming back as the firstborn from among the dead, the first fruits of those that will rise from the dead, showing us a little glimpse of what the life everlasting is like. And it's connected because he has breakfast on the beach. And yet there's some kind of vast superiority to it because he's not there and then he's there. And he walks through a wall like you walk through a cloud of smoke because he's so much more solid than that thing. He's able to be unrecognizable and then recognizable. He's able to be one place and then another place. And we can hardly even begin to imagine that life. It's, it's like an oak tree connected compared with an acorn, like a walnut tree connected with a walnut. Thank you. But people say, well, yeah, but Philip, isn't it a spiritual body? The Bible says we'll have a spiritual body. Well, let's read what Paul says. He says this. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. Everyone say natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Everyone say spiritual body. At which point you say, yeah, see, I told you. A spiritual body. In other words, immaterial, uh, ethereal, ethereal. It, it is kind of floaty and, and wispy. It's a spiritual body. God is a spirit. You can't see him because he's spirit. That's what the Bible says. And so we're going to have a spiritual body. We're going to be like spirits in a material world. The Bible says spiritual body and natural body. And this is where a little bit of Greek comes in handy to understand what Paul is saying because he's, he's grasping and, 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 and just struggling to wrestle the language into some kind of control because we lack the language to tell this kind of story. But he says natural body. Now when he says natural body, the Greek is soma psyche. So psyche is where we get the word psychology or just your psyche. It, it means your soul. So what he's literally saying is, right now you have a, a soul body. Everyone say, I have a soul body. <laughs> Some more than others. Uh, you have a soul body. In other words, it's a body that is powered by a soul. It's a body that is subject to all the human foibles and failings, all the laws of entropy and degradation and degeneration that falls to pieces and, and runs out of steam. But one day we'll have a spiritual body. The best way I can put it uh, is like this. Look at these two submarines. Take a look. Okay, two submarines. They look very, very similar. Same kind of colors, same kind of, you've got the con tower or whatever it's called, propellers, fins, and similar shape. Does anyone know what the difference is between those two submarines? What differentiates them? Shout it. Yeah, very good. Engine, nuclear, you got it. Um, one's a conventional and one's a new... Yeah, well, back. <laughs> one's a conventional and one's a nuclear submarine. We all live in a nuclear submarine. Now, a conventional submarine and a nuclear submarine, there's not that much difference to the naked eye. They're both made of, of, of uh, metal, uh, rivets. I guess it's not rivets, but whatever they're made of. It could be walnuts for all I know. I'm not an expert on this stuff. <laughs> but they're fairly similar. But what differentiates them is the engine, what they're powered by. And this is the metaphor that Paul is using. And so when you look at a conventional, uh, new, uh, conventional submarine, it's powered by diesel. Doesn't mean that the submarine is made of diesel. Doesn't mean that the submarine is all liquidy and, and oily because it's made of diesel. No, it's a submarine that has substance, but it's powered by a diesel engine. And it doesn't mean when you say a nuclear submarine, you say, oh, a nuclear submarine. Oh, well, we know what nuclear energy is. 
Nuclear is when you split the atom and you can't see it, uh, but there's prodigious power, but you, you can't have any way of seeing it. So maybe a nuclear submarine is, is made of, of nuclear energy and you can't see No, 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 no. What it means is it's powered by nuclear energy. So you could put a conventional submarine in the water and just slide it under the waves for a week before you need to come up and uh, that engine's got to be seen to and the fuel's got to be replenished. You can, you can go for about a week. Nuclear submarine, you can put that thing under the oceans for a hundred years before it runs out. I mean, all the crew are dead by then, but <laughs> the point is, it's got this power that is vastly superior. And when Paul talks, the language that he's using, it's basically a soul-powered body versus a spirit-powered body. Right now I have a body and it's powered by soulish mechanism, earthly mechanism, things that degrade and things that fall to pieces and things that let me down and things that break down. And one day the Bible says I will have a body that is powered by God's spirit. Everyone say amen. amen. The spirit of God, immortal, invisible, powering my body and not just a body that I have now but a body that is as to this body as a oak tree is to a acorn unbelievable this is of primary importance I believe in the life everlasting and if I believe in the life everlasting then I believe that God has great things for me in the future I believe that my eyes can be set on something greater. I believe that the future that God has for me is a wonderful, glorious future. Hard for me to understand, just like it would be hard for a fetus, an embryo in the womb. To understand, yes, you have a life. Yes, you have experience, but it's nothing compared with what you will have. And even though you pass through this experience and it's, it's frightening to come out of the womb, the life on the other side is just, we don't have the language to tell you how good it is, but trust me, it is vastly, incredibly superior. And the Bible says in the same way, the life that we have, that God has got for us is incredible. It is amazing. It's more solid than this solidity. It's more real than this reality. It's more powerful than this power that we experience right now. And I will have one day a body that is powered by God's spirit, his energy, his life, powering my body, never decaying, never running dry, never letting me down, never without end. That's what we have. And so, ladies and gentlemen, do you know what I have? I don't have a bucket list. I have a post bucket list. <laughs> I have a bunch of things that I have on my list that I'm going to do. I'm just going to do them after I'm dead. I'm going to do them in the age to come when I have a way better body. That, that house, I don't have the time to build the house and I certainly don't have the job to make it a reality. So I'm just going to do it later. I'm going to do it in a better age. I'm going to do it because I've got plenty of time to do that and more. And I don't know what. Maybe I build it on Alpha Centauri. Maybe I have dark matter decking. Maybe my foyer is in seven dimensions. I don't know. But I, I invite you to come there one day. Even as I say that I realize that I'm embarrassing myself, my future self will be embarrassed at the paucity of my ambition. Because one day God will say, what do you want to build a house for when you could design a galaxy? You can invite your friends around to sunbathe in a supernova. Because the life of the age to come is a life of glory and wonder. And it's connected to what we do here and now. So Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, and it's a very, very practical letter, he gives them all the theology, and then he gives them all these practical things about relationships and marriage and all these different things. But he culminates it with this, because what you do in this age is connected with the age to come. Like a seed is connected to the plant that it grows into. And he said, we need to have this perspective on life. That it's not just eat, drink, be married, and then we die. It's not just bucket list. It's not just YOLO. Way better than that. We should be proclaiming this message from the rooftops. We should be telling everyone that we can. We should be praying every day for those that we love. 
that they would receive a revelation of Jesus Christ. And this is how Paul finishes things. He says this, For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always, read that with me, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Carry on, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So Paul paints this unbelievable picture of the age to come and then he pulls it right back into the present and he says whatever you do don't give up don't stop what you're doing continue loving continue serving continue proclaiming continue being gracious continue fighting for justice for continue bringing in the marginalized continue healing the sick proclaiming the good news to the poor because it's connected because what we do in this age, it has resonance in the age to come, the life everlasting. And I want us to pray, and I want us to pray and ask that God would give us a bigger vision. Let us not be Christians who walk through our faith with our eyes on the floor. Let's look up and see the hope to which God has called us. And for those of us whose lives have been touched, maybe for some of you, that sting of death that harshness of, of, of the grave, you know bereavement, you know grief. It's an ever-present thing. Maybe it's, it's a very recent thing. Without minimizing any of that, the Bible says, ultimately, Jesus has taken the sting out of that. He's defanged that serpent, and he gives us the victory. And one day, that victory will be culminated in the age to come. So let's pray that God gives us a vision of what he's called us to. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those that love him. Paul says, what we are to be has not yet been revealed. We see through a glass darkly, but one day we see God face to face. We'll be powered by his spirit. Let's pray. Father God, Lord Jesus, our living hope, would you give us a vision of the age to come, the life everlasting? Would it not just be something tacked on to the end of a creed, but a reality that we carry with us day by day? Lord God, would you help us would you motivate us? Would you compel us with your love to call in those on the outside? And I pray, Lord God, for those here this morning that don't know that they have this to look forward to, that are not sure of their salvation. I pray that you'd call them in. I pray that even today, this morning, people would walk into your arms, give their lives to you, trust their future to you. I pray, Lord God, we wouldn't be people that live YOLO lives, bucket list lives but we would live with our eyes fixed on the life to come in the name of jesus and lord i want to pray as well for those struggling with grief and sadness because of the sting of death lord let us receive your hope and your comfort that you offer that you take away the sting and you rob death of its victory so would you comfort those that mourn? Would you stand with those that grieve? And would you empower us to share this good news with all around us in Jesus' name? Amen.